19,392 is apparently the number of days uh, that I have left to live. And although it sounds like a lot, um, over the last few years, I've come to realize that uh, it probably takes you a good five years to achieve something meaningful. Turns out that uh, 19,392 is really only 10 of those five-year blocks. So when you think about having to achieve 10 things, and that's all you've got, you'd be much wiser in how you spent each of those chapters. I'm going to talk today not so much about our story, but about how I spent my first two chapters, and really more about how that experience changed the way I view the world and changed the way I view New Zealand. The story really starts when I was 14. I started my first company, but I didn't really get my first proper start until 2001. Uh, when I left my job, I had a job once, and started the Hyperfactory. Before I knew what the Hyperfactory was, I spent several months in a row trying to imagine the future. And in my apartment in Anzac Avenue, I would plaster the walls with brown paper, and I would spend all day and all night until two, three, four in the morning, reading magazines, books, the web, videos, anything I could get my hands on to understand where the future was going. I would take those lessons and scribble on that brown paper and put sticky notes everywhere and sit back and try and connect the dots. Three, four months went by and my parents flatmates and, f and friends, pretty sure I was going a bit crazy. This was before A Beautiful Mind, <laughs> which would have made them certain I was going crazy. The question soon became, what exactly was I looking for? What I was looking for was patterns. I was looking for patterns that would create or disrupt industries and have profound impact on the future of them. I was looking for patterns that would create greenfield opportunities in the hundreds of millions, if not billions. And I was looking for patterns that would be growing rapidly and scale by hundreds of percents a year for a decade or more. And lastly, I was looking for patterns that I was willing to invest maybe one or two of those chapters of my life in. So the Hyperfactory was born on one premise as a result of the intersection of many patterns. The first pattern was the decreasing cost of computing processing power. The second pattern was the increasing mobility of society. The third pattern was the decreasing cost of mobile devices. And the fourth pattern was the marketing world's movement from a history of broadcasting to a future of interactivity and personalization. The premise was that the mobile phone or the mobile device would be the most powerful communication device ever to have existed. And the hyperfactory was going to be built around helping organizations and brands understand how to use that medium. So we set up shop in Auckland, and we grew relatively rapidly after the first year or two of everybody saying no. And when we had a bit of confidence, we then went overseas and started opening up offices in far too many places and doing far too many things wrong. But that's a different story. We ended up in Hong Kong, Shanghai, India, Sydney, LA, New York, Chicago, San Francisco, basically anywhere I liked and thought we should be. <laughs> and 
And the business went really well for quite a while. We raised some money and we accelerated everything that we were doing in the worst year in the history of the century to choose to accelerate, 2008. And we ran straight into September 2008, just as we were ramping up the hardest. Overnight, we couldn't really see any uh, revenue past about 30 or 60 days, which became a very, very scary prospect. We had run out of cash many times before at the Hyperfactory, and I accepted that as a part of life as an entrepreneur and as a part of taking risks to build businesses. But this time felt very, very different. I genuinely didn't think that we would be able to find capital or solve the issue and started to get used to the idea that after seven or eight years and a lot of work, maybe the story was going to come to an end. Over December and January, as I got used to this concept, preparing for the worst, tides of conflicting emotions swept over me for the series of months to follow. On the one hand, I started to get used to the idea that maybe none of this was really important because I had my health, my family, and I can always come back to New Zealand and sit on a beach for free. But on the other hand, it's really important because we'd spent eight years doing this, we had a vision, it was coming to life, other people had bought in it, and we had to finish this off, and we couldn't quit. We had to keep going. On one hand, none of it really mattered because we're not saving lives, we are not curing cancer, we're in mobile and marketing. But on the other hand, all of it really mattered because pioneers are the people that pave way for the future. And I really wanted to create a model that was an inspiration for other New Zealanders and young people to create global companies from this country. So on one hand, you have your foot out in the ocean, battered by the storms, and going for everything with the highest standards and the highest goals, because you only have one life, and you better use every day and live it if it was your last. On the other hand, you have one foot in the bay, calm, cherishing every moment that you've got, being happy for the because you have your health and you only have one life, so you better live every day as if it was your last. Which path is the right path? Which of those statements is true? I got used to the idea that all of them were right and all of it is true. And it's come to be called, for me, living in the tension of opposites. In hard times, I often look to my idols or heroes, of which I have many. And in this particular time, I turned to Napoleon. I was looking at letters on the internet that he wrote to his generals when they were up against huge odds. One of them goes like this. We are in a time where you need double the resolve and double the vigor of ordinary times. Lead by example. Be the first to put yourself in danger. And with the troops that you have, I expect you to defeat double of theirs. This is what I took back to the hyperfactory and back to our team and decided that we were going to make it through this crisis and come out the other end. And luck would have it that our team is strong enough, we believed in ourselves enough, 
which made other people believe in us too, and they still do. I feel that at 30, having to, have to go through that, facing the prospect of starting all over again and losing everything, made me question my values and what I was doing with my life. But I feel blessed that I had to experience that, staring down the barrel of failure because it played a large role in changing the way I see things. When I was 21 and starting out, I was aspiring to be an entrepreneur because I wanted to build businesses. And I wanted to make a living, I wanted to make a mark, and I really wanted to make money. 10 years on, after this period, I started to see things very differently. And I started to see entrepreneurship as one of the greatest assets of society to make the world a potentially better place. As an answer to many of the world's ills and as an enabler to much of the world's opportunity. I see the values in entrepreneurship as very similar to the values of humanity and the values that got someone to the moon and the values that will solve cancer and the values that will eradicate global poverty. After this period, I decided to do three things. First, I went to Africa and discovered and learned all about how entrepreneurship and microfinance and microloans were empowering micro-entrepreneurs to lift themselves out of poverty in the present. Second, I bought a ticket to space with Richard Branson's Virgin Galactic because I wanted to see the world from up there as one and be inspired by the future. And third, I bought that letter that Napoleon had wrote to remind myself of the past and to never give up. With the young leaders and entrepreneurs that I try to associate myself with, I see a very promising pattern that of one where they weave into their lives a social element of good and a general interest in the progress of the world, along with their entrepreneurship and commercial ambitions. It's no longer cool enough to just be in this to make money. There needs to be a purpose larger than oneself and a cause. This interest has really driven my interest in what are the levers that move the world forward. And as a byproduct of that, what moves New Zealand forward? There is a really scary pattern emerging in New Zealand that has appeared over the last few decades and has resulted in an invisible crisis. The cracks of this country have been appearing for years and been patched up with a nation built on pillars of the past and a total lack of investment in the foundations of the future. Our GDP and our wealth and our income has been dropping for the last 40 years steadily compared to the rest of the developed world. Our GDP per worker is around 80,000, compared to Denmark's 180,000, and Australia's 140,000. Our highest earning industry, the dairy industry, generates $300,000 in revenue per person, but on average, we generate the same amount of revenue per person as a country as McDonald's does. Apple, to give you a comparison, generates $2 million per employee. There's a company called Foxconn, 
which some of you may have heard of. It makes Apple's devices and products, the iPod, iPad, iPhone. It has a million employees in China. It does $60 billion in revenue. And it's worth about $34 billion, which is pretty impressive. Apple has 50,000 employees, generates 60 billion in revenue, and is worth $340 billion. I know which company I'd rather be. Our dairy industry is the Foxconn of dairy. Are we an innovative nation? Maybe. There are pockets of innovation everywhere. We are probably more inventive than we are innovative. Innovation requires commercialization of an idea. If we are so innovative, why does Nestle control 6,000 brands and Fonterra controls six? Why is Nestle 10 times the size of Fonterra and their profit is twice Fonterra's revenue? Switzerland has 1.6 million cows compared to our six. So where's the hope? Well, the hope is out there in the world. That's where our market is. That's the future of New Zealand. There has never been a time in the world where there is so much opportunity requiring so little capital where the barriers to entry globally are so few. So New Zealand is on the threshold of a new New Zealand, if it chooses to be. Because we live in a time where the fastest growing company in the history of the world was created two years ago by a 27-year-old and will generate one billion in revenue this year and is preparing for an IPO of $30 billion next year called Groupon. And we live in a world where a 26-year-old, a little over five years ago, created a company that now has a community approaching one billion people and a valuation of $100 billion. And we live in a world where a social gaming company called Zynga unleashed on you and me and everybody else a game called Farmville, which has more virtual farmers in it, farming virtual crops and virtual livestock, than 25 New Zealands, and generates more revenue to give itself a market value greater than our real world equivalent, Fonterra. We live in a world where these three companies I just named were started by children and they are worth over $140 billion, greater than our GDP. As we continue through the 21st century, New Zealand can choose to be an idle bystander or it can choose to be a shaper of that century. The former path is a path to failure and irrelevance as a country. And those failures as a collective will cast a long black shadow over the land of the long white cloud for many, many years to come. So the question is, what can you do? You're only one person. I'll read you something from another of my heroes, Robert Kennedy, who said, great men and women move the world, and so can we all. Few will have the greatness to bend history itself, but each of us can work to change small portions of events. And in the total of all these acts will be written the history of this generation. If I had my way with all of you here, I would send you 
on a tour of the world. I would send you to Africa and India to see the enormity of the challenges that humanity faces. And then I would send you to Silicon Valley and Israel and Singapore to see the enormity of the opportunity and energy and belief that people have in the future. I would ask you to research all the areas of the future and carve you up into groups. Green tech, social, cloud, tablet, mobile, and lock you up in one of those crazy rooms for three months so you can brown paper the walls and come out telling me what the patterns of the future are because they're there. And then I would ask each and every one of you to quit your jobs, drop out of university, and start building something. Because we need people to join the revolution of the future, and we need them in the thousands in New Zealand, not the hundreds. Choose to be different. Choose to do something about the crisis that this country is increasingly hurtling towards. And I know for a fact that if all 300 of you here did exactly what I just said, that there isn't really a group of 300 people anywhere else in the world that has a better chance than you of succeeding, that three of you are likely to have succeeded beyond your wildest imaginations and create significant corporations or organizations or technologies or innovations that change the world and move us forward. 30 of you will have built something to be proud of and something that you never expected you could have done. A big chunk of you will have failed, but will start again and eventually succeed. The rest of you will quit and vow never to do anything as crazy as that again. The question is, are you crazy enough to believe you can be one of those three? Here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs in the square holes, the ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules, and they have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify or vilify them. About the only thing you can't do is ignore them because they change things. They push the human race forward. And while some may see them as the crazy ones, we see genius. Because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. Thank you.